This week, we're taking a closer look at the Jean Benet Ramsey case. We're breaking down the key moments of body language and behavior from Patsy, Burke, and John Ramsey. Let us know what you think in the comments. Mrs. Ramsey, it's my understanding that the Colorado Bureau of Investigation took your handwriting samples to the Secret Service. Do you know the results of that test? Definitively? Mm, no, I don't. I just, no, we had experts do the same kind of testing, and it's my understanding that the people that, that we use trained the people from the CBI, Colorado Bureau, that they administered the test. And they, on a scale of one to five, with five being absolutely no match, I ranked at a 4.5, with one being a perfect match. So, you know. And we don't, we don't know the results. All right, I'll go first on this one. When she's nodding yes, we see her squint when they talk about the Secret Service. Her, she freezes and you see that, and that those eyes squint up. So something's there. I don't think she knew that had happened. Because once they say that, once they throw in that jab at her, in other words, she comes back with, um, well, here's what I do know, that I'm not the person that did it, and here's all the proof that tells why. That's what I'm seeing. That stuck out to me like, I, you know, like a red flag. But Greg, what do you got? Yeah, I, I'm on the same page. Watch her pupils. There's a flash in her pupils in this, like you don't get the opportunity to see very often. Her, her pupils go to pinpoint and then back out a little. Um, when she does that squint thing, I'm with you. I think if she really believes that whatever she has, her expert's better than your expert, is what she just said. My expert taught your expert. So there, I'll see your expert and raise you another. If she really believed that and didn't know about the, the Secret Service doing it, she probably would quickly go, uh oh, there's, there's a piece of data I didn't expect. And the squint is data intake. And whether you call it fake concern or concern, she's doing data intake. So those are really big things for me. And the other one is, Mark, you brought up last time she's lip grooming. This is not lip grooming. That was a quick jut. That usually is distaste. That usually is disapproval, whatever. Desmond Morris said it's our first no. It's how we push a nipple away from our lips. And so it's rejection of an idea, rejection of that. I, it makes me want to talk to her more about the handwriting. And in fact, guys, if you really want to know about the handwriting, there are hours and hours and hours of stuff about her handwriting, about her talking to in a deposition about the handwriting. So you can go and dig into this for yourself and not not just look at what we're doing in body language. Um, Chase, what do you got? Let's keep in mind uh, when they're talking about handwriting analysis, they're talking not about graphology, which is... Right. Uh, referred to sometimes as a, as a pseudoscience. They're referring to the characteristic and nature of how letters are constructed and written and whether or not they match someone else, all the way down to pressure of the pen on, on the paper. Great call out. Great call out. Yep. Right here, she starts out discrediting the evidence instead of making any kind of denial. Makes no denial, as a matter of fact, whatsoever. And she says... It's my understanding that the people that that we use trained the people from the CBI. And this is the first thing that uh, any good lawyer is going to teach you to say during an interview. You always say, it's my understanding, and you can never be backed into any corner for the rest of your life. And, and I think that's just being used here. And I think it's interesting they would hire people to analyze their own handwriting to begin with. Mark? Yeah. So uh, here's what we see again is this uh, playoff of status there instantly goes to, as Greg was saying, you know, my graphologist is better than your graphologist, my graphologist, you know, trained your graphologist. So so kind of almost the resume statement or, or, or resumes at dawn. It's a dueling match is going on immediately. Uh, and here's why I think this is important for our perception of her is it's very aloof and high status. And I think what we want to see is the public from her is sorrow and loss. And she doesn't give us any sorrow and loss. So I think what we need to do as a public kind of watching this is go, what am I really wanting from her? And if she isn't able to give it to me, might I be against her? Might it cause a bias in me? I think her aloofness here easy, easily triggers us into a bias against her because she is a mother. And from a mother, we want to see continued sorrow and loss. 
thoughts around this. That's all I've got. And, oh, I will bring up a, a, again as well this idea of the of the urban myth, and and the idea that in urban myths, in mythology, you often get children going missing. It's a classic of mythology, and also. Um, uh, infanticide, you know, parents killing their kids as well. So again, as a public here, we are in this wonderful world of mythology of the most horrible crimes of parents killing kids or um, or kids just going missing, being taken away by the fairies. So again, we've got to check in with ourselves around this and make sure that mythology isn't biasing us and that we can get to the real truth of what's going on here. Okay, let me leave it at that. Guys, this is going to be another McCann's for us. People are going to hate or love us because they made up their mind a thousand years ago and all their evidence is right. There's, their expert's going to be better than our expert. You know, they're going to say, this expert said that. So we're going to see that too. This is a mess. None of us know what happened in this house. And, you know, I always say, Somebody says, well, it couldn't be, she couldn't have killed her child because she's not a murderer. And my answer is, murder is a crime of passion and people do stupid things. Mrs. Ramsey, it's my understanding that the Colorado Bureau of Investigation took your handwriting samples to the Secret Service. Do you know the results of that test? Definitively? Mm, no, I don't. I just, no, we had experts do the same kind of testing and it's my understanding that the people that, that we use trained the people from the CBI, Colorado Bureau, that, that administered the test. And they, on a scale of one to five, with five being absolutely no match, I ranked at a 4.5, with one being perfect match. So, you know. Yeah, we don't, we don't know the reason. All right, well, let's throw it around the room and let's come up with uh, two words for what you think is going on here. Greg? Jury's out. What about you, Chase? Uh, guilty knowledge. Mark? Guilty of bad public perception. I know it's not two words, but I don't do two words. <laughs> All right. Then I, mine would be, uh, I don't know. I don't know what I'd say. I, I don't know what I'd say. I don't have two words for it. I talk too much. Let's clear this up once and for all. Did you do anything to harm your sister, John Bonet. No. Did you murder your sister, John Bonet? No. All right, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so the first question there is is kind of, I don't know whether there's such a thing, but for me, a reverse Barnum statement. You know, did you do anything to harm your sister? Well, of course you did. Of course you did. I mean, I've done things that have harmed my brothers and sisters. Uh, anybody who says, I've never done anything that's ever harmed a sibling, is like, of course you have. Your brothers and sisters. Like, it happens, you know, all the time. Even if you didn't think it happens, they think it happened. So he's being put in a bit of a corner around this one, but still it's a relatively strong denial there. No. But when you put it against the denial of, did you, um, did you murder your sister? I think, I'm not sure whether that's the exact question or not. No. We then get alongside that, the full shake of the head that goes alongside that. So I think what we're seeing there is the competition of one question, not you can't really answer the first question in any truthful way, I believe. The second one uh, is is way more forceful. Um, so I think there's a there's you know that's interesting to look at. I think what people worry about is the look and the maybe little bite of the lip that we get, tiny and the tiny look afterwards. After that, that's him just seeking approval from the person of status. He wants the person of status to go okay. Fine, I, you know, will will take that from you. It is a look for approval from status, not a look from a you're buying my my story on both counts on that one. And again, you know, that's 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 the problem. That glance for approval at the end is going to easily look like something a furtive glance, which has something devious behind it. I do not believe it's furtive. I do not believe it's devious. It comes from a place of just a kid wanting to get it right. And who's on the, on the brink of, you know, they've got nothing more to give. Greg, what do you got? 
Yeah, so much like what you saw. There's a piece that you could say they're fading facts because he's quiet. No. No. I wish, Doc, I wish you would have said, why should I believe you didn't harm or kill your sister? That would give us more narrative. But I think he already by this point realizes this guy's not that guy. He doesn't chase you at it early. When a person gives you information voluntarily and you ask enough questions along the way, you know where he's going to stop. You probably can't get, get any more out of him than that. These yes, no questions or in interrogation speak leading questions eliminate his ability to go much further. I see distaste and I see apprehension. When he bites his lip as he's trying to figure out how Dr. Phil perceives him, he purses his lips a little bit as he's thinking. And now I'll give you my guess. My guess is this guy's somewhere back in his head. He's he's got some either regression or arrested development or something going on. I, I can't say he's on the spectrum or where or what, but there's certainly body language that makes me think of not adult behavior in many cases that he's been around a different world than I have. I don't know where he, he got to this point, but I don't see him trying to hide. Hey, no, I did it. And I'm trying to hide. I don't see it. I don't see it at all. I'll also say this. I say this a million times. Here's a million and one. I can see certain things in body language that make me want to go ask the next question and get the next piece of information. I can't read his mind. He could be a genius who is hiding everything. But what I see based on body language are things that would make me ask him that next question and probably get him to just kind of start to come and bolt it a little bit. That's that's it. That's what I see. Chase, what do you see? Yeah, I think a, a lot of body language pundits, I think Mark calls them. <laughs> we'll, we'll think it's it's like the guy with the hammer thinks everything's a nail. So we tend to think that this is like the end all be all of body language, but not at all. This is a, a very small tool in a lot of our toolkit here. Yes. That is questioning techniques are 10 times more effective at detecting or getting to the truth than body language. Yep. It's my opinion. Yep. And if you're ever asking somebody if they did a crime, it's 10 times better to say something softer than kill. So it's always better. So if you're asking an interrogation question or you're trying to see if someone did something, it's, it's, you're more likely to get a response if you say hurt or injure or something like that. He did actually attack his sister with a golf club uh, before this, as far as what I read uh, online, we're not the forensics panel. It didn't happen in the video, so I'm not gonna go into it. So we, we've all hurt siblings, especially if you're an older brother. I am an <laughs> older brother and uh, I've hurt my sister many times, pushed her down, done all kinds of stuff. But he says no there. But when he realizes this tough question is coming, his eyes immediately go back to that seven, eight o'clock exit search to look towards the exit because he knows this question is going to come. I'm sure he knows that uh, he's been told, we're going to ask you some tough questions. And there's some severe discomfort shifting between his five and seven o'clock positions and then back to Dr. Phil here. And his head shaking no and saying no don't occur simultaneously. So they're asynchronous, but that is only one or two indicators here of high stress. Remember, there's no body language for deception. There is no body language for deception. I don't care what you see on LinkedIn. It doesn't exist. But Chase, I touched my nose. <laughs> I've got a big nose. So Scott's a big liar. <laughs> oh, yeah, I'd be the biggest liar. I hit my back, so just when I'm talking, I move my hands to my illustrators. Hit my nose too much. Sorry to step in, but I had to. I mean... <laughs> there is one interesting thing that I found in here. I had to go get a 1080p version of this video and blow it up. And then I had to download a program that's made for radiologists to perform measurements on things. His pupils dilate one millimeter uh, when he's making the denial. And if you if you look real good and if our if our video is pretty high quality when when Scott puts it up there, you'll be able to see it and you can actually see it just dragging your your mouse back and forth. Doesn't mean deception. Everything else points to baseline deviations of stress and not baseline deviations towards deception. And there's not a big enough cluster here for him to even reach the threshold of a, a score of 11 on the behavioral table of elements. Scott. 
Cool. All right. You guys have covered just about everything. But something I found interesting in this is he's got his hands together. He's got them clasped together there between his legs. And his sweaters pulled down to cover his wrists. As we all know, when someone is, feels good about being around someone, especially uh, females, when they see men they're trying to impress or, or, or want to get along with better, you'll see their, their wrists exposed a little bit more. And they'll show their wrists more. In this case, they're, they're covered up all, all the way down to where his thumb starts almost. So it may be that he's cold. It may be that he feels unsafe. It may be where he's just over everything so far and just trying to get as hard as he can to get comfortable because these things take a long time when you're talking about those things, especially in a, in a TV interview. And going back to to his one word answers, and like Greg was saying, he does say uh, when he answers, it's, it's that one word. It's it's fairly quiet. No, but when you ask someone like that, I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and say I think he's on the autism spectrum. You ask him a yes or no question, they'll give you a yes or no answer, and that's what you're supposed to give those anyway. But that's what he does. You give him you give him a question like that, and that's what. And I think Doctor Phil knew that, and I think that's why he lobbed that at him like that. Sort of prepped him for it, and the kid saw it coming worked his way up to it um and that that's fine when they do that that's fine but he hates that question that's another reason that that he, that he gets quiet as well so you guys have covered everything on that let's clear this up once and for all did you do anything to harm your sister john bonnet no did you murder your sister john bonnet no okay so uh, why don't we throw it around the room and let's give our, our overview of what we think happened um, or what we saw today. When it, it, we'll compare it, the uh, truth to deception and let's say what we happened in the case. Everybody's always got their, their opinions on it. Let's do that as well. Greg, you want to go first? Yeah. As far as what happened in the case, I have no clue. I'm going to tell you this. When we watched Patsy Ramsey, I initially, you know, from things I'd seen in the past, thought, well, maybe she did something. And there's certainly places where she appears to have some kind of guilty knowledge. Is that because she's guilty of doing a crime or she feels guilty because something happened, she didn't repair when, I, I don't know. I don't know what happened in this case, but based on what I see in this video, and when I watched him from a distance without really paying attention, I thought, that's a creepy guy. But when you watch it and you go see it, now I'm seeing congruent messaging, not strong messaging, because it's not a strong person who's saying, no, I didn't do this and, and, and. He's not trying to justify. I think he's been doing this for 20 plus years to people that know him or people he runs into. Guarantee you, when somebody meets us at a party or we walk out to get hot chicken and they see us, they want to talk about the body language and behave, and they want to talk about, about behavior panel. When you're Burke, Guess what they want to talk about? The only thing they want to talk about. It's not about the news, not about the weather. It's about did you kill or do you know who killed? So all I see here is a guy that I think is in some kind of regression. I think he has been sheltered in a weird way and didn't develop the same way you developed or I developed. So that's what I see. I see confusing for average people, certainly. But that's it. Mark. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I only see one area that I think he's not telling us everything, which is on the question of, did you ever hurt your sister? And I, and I only say that just because, of course he did. <laughs> like, it's just natural that that happens. That's just the law of averages says you're going to hurt a sibling at, at some point. So so that's the only thing that I see is as being, uh, you know, hidden or deceitful. The rest of it, I think he's being... Uh, relatively kind of brutally honest and and factual around it. And I think we see somebody who is trying to dredge up this nine-year-old uh, um, history and it not quite making sense and time getting compressed and it being quite confusing and about now kind of at the end of their lifespan of being able to tolerate and, and, and keep that smile going around all of this, you know, to be in this pageant for, for everybody. He's getting trotted out all the time going, okay, walk up and down the platform and, and prove yourself and show yourself to the world. And I think he's, you know, he's got tired of it uh, about, about now. Um, yeah, that's, that's all I got for you on that. Uh, Chase, what do you think? I think uh, we're seeing an outlier here. I don't think there's a whole lot of deception, but I do think there are some secrets, which are different things. Yes. And I think that there's stuff being withheld and there is a potential for some guilty knowledge here. Not just not just the mom, but I think I think there is guilty knowledge. 
in in him. And that's all I'll say. Scott? All right. Here's what I think happened. Well, I think I think we're seeing a lot of, I think he's being honest and a lot of that. I agree with you, Chase. I think there's some guilty knowledge there, but I think that comes with trying to keep the information about his family, about his mom and dad. In those situations, I think those kind of people are those kind of people. But I mean, they try to keep anything about their family to themselves. They try to keep it all quiet. So not that he's aware of thinking, I've got to keep it all quiet, but I think he's trying to keep some extra information that he may know to himself, whether that's that's somebody in the family had to do with it or not. I have no earthly idea, but here's what I think happened. I don't think he did it. And I think somebody else did it. And I think the mom and dad thought he did it at the beginning that's when they conjured all this stuff up with the, uh, the the ransom note and all these things, right? Then they find out he didn't do it. They realize, oh, no, somebody did come in. They see all this other evidence that shows them that, that somebody else did it, but they're committed, and it's too late to go back. And that's where the ego comes in because they're going to say, well, we did it because of this. That's Because at that point, you're full of it. And they're going to say, well, maybe you did do it. So I think that's what they did. They, they got into it, got too sticky for them when they realized what happened, and they had to stick with that with that story. I think that's what happened. So it's, it may sound crazy, but it's the only logical explanation, explanation I can come up with, uh, with all that that's given and all that. John, we, I need to ask the question for all these people here. They need to hear your voice. Did you murder your daughter? No. Did Patsy? No. Did Burke? No, that's no. Why should we believe you? Well, <clears throat> um, Based, based on what the media reported, I don't know how you could believe otherwise. And we used to get letters from people that say, oh, you know, I, for years I thought you were the murderers of, murderers of your daughter, and I'm so sorry I felt that way. And I, I'd write them back and say, that's okay. How could you have believed otherwise based on what you were being told? Uh, you know, the media was vicious to us. The police were vicious. People were wonderful to us. Uh, you know, I was asked early on, how is it to be out in public? And I said, it's wonderful. People stop us, give us hugs, apologize for what's being said about us. I said it really gave me an a understanding or an appreciation of my fellow man, that they care about other people. And it, it changed me personally. You know, I was pretty much, a, I don't know, just insensitive, I guess, to the fact that most people carry a heavy burden. Mm -hmm. And life's not easy. And uh, I was just so touched by the people that would stop. And that even happened today. Uh, and it, this was a blessing. Uh, people stop us and, and pray for us. And, you know, um, at this meeting. And um, so people were wonderful to us. But, of course, the media was vicious. It was a, it was a uh, made-for-TV entertainment. And it was a billion-dollar industry for the media. Um, the John Bonet Inc. It was called uh, in a in a magazine publication. Uh, you know, we came along when the O.J. Simpson trial had ended, and there was this whole bandwidth of media, court TV, all these things that were came up and alive because of the O.J. Simpson trial, and that was over. It's like, hey, what do we do with all this airtime? Well, then we came along and and filled it. All right, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, it's interesting. We always say you should hear an emphatic no when a person is denying something. He does an emphatic no. Did you murder your daughter? No. When he's asked if Patsy did it, he does an emphatic no. Did Patsy? No. And then when he's asked if Burke did, he says no, and he trails off and starts to say something. Did Burke? No, that's no. And she steps on him. Why should we believe you? And we don't know what he would have said. Whatever that was, I would have gone back and cleaned that up and said, what exactly were you talking about right here? Just give him a chance to talk. But it's, unnat it's natural for a person to step over that and let the person go, especially when it's a situation where you're talking about their closest loved ones. This guy's lost two daughters, I believe, and a wife. So, uh, and, and I think he had lost a daughter in an accident before. But he's doing sacred space, what I call sacred space. He's barriering and adapting. So he's grinding his hands and making a barrier out of him when he's being asked about his family. Once he comes out of that, his whole baseline goes to normal. He starts talking. He does do one thing that's interesting is when she starts asking him about the questions, he starts to move off and not actually answer questions about why should we not think it's you and just starts answering questions about, I don't know how you would not think it's me. 
with all the media has done to us. Based on what the media reported, I don't know how you could believe otherwise. But then to bring up things about other people. And we used to get letters from people that say, oh, you know, I, for years I thought you were the murderers of, murderers of your daughter, and I'm so sorry I felt that way. I realize this guy's done this for 20 years. 20 plus years he's been talking about the loss of this kid and about the treatment and how they've been perceived. He also is keenly aware he's in front of CrimeCon. And if you say he's not making eye contact, he's looking down at the audience. Uh, if you look at video of all of us at the live event, our eyes are all cast down because we're looking at people. Same thing here. She's so anxious to get her next question that she's drumming her fingers. It's interesting to watch. But she doesn't want to cut him off, and you can see that. You can see a good baseline from him. I see pretty congruent messaging here. I hear emphatic, emphatic, emphatic with some qualifiers. I wish we could have heard what the qualifiers were. We all have our own opinion. We have reviewed Burke, but I'd love to hear what his is. Uh, Chase, what do you got? Yeah, so we see more counting on fingers here. There's rising pitch when he makes the denial about himself. No. And I know some people may jump on that. This does not mean deception because there's not a cluster of behavior. When you hear all of us dogpile onto a behavior, you're hearing us just layer this mountain of behavioral indicators together. Those are clusters. There is a cluster of behavior in an unusual place here, though, is denial about Burke. No, that's no. This was the strongest hesitancy. The only time he repeats himself, the strongest head and eye aversion from the person asking the question, the largest hand movement. And this would be a red flag, not deception necessarily. This just means that there's more for us to ask exactly what Greg was just telling you. This is just another place where there's something that needs to come out because something's there. There's something present there that's different than the other two denials. Uh, Scott, what do you got? I agree with you. I think there's something else there, but I think what that something else is, is his anger toward all the fingers that have been pointing uh, toward Burke. I think that's, and so he's trying not to go off on a, a tangent there about his thoughts on that, which he probably could have done, like you said, Greg, if she hadn't stepped on him. So that kind of, that got on my nerves a little bit. But I'm under the impression he knows what the questions are going to be, because what else, what other questions are there besides what he's been asked a thousand times? His legs are crossed. Uh, as uses those as a barrier, but I think it's for the question more than for the interviewer. And um, he uses hands again as, 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 as adapters. The first two knows on whether uh, he killed or they killed the child. He, he, his, he did, his wife did, or Burke did. The first two knows are, are close, but then it, obviously, as we talked about a second ago, the third one's a little bit different, but it goes from no, 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 no. No. Like that. It's like, dun, dun, dun. No, no, no. So he's, he's getting more relaxed as he goes along because, but it's very quick. His answer is very fast at the top of that. Almost like he was uh, not angry, but he's poking back there just a little bit. Then when she asks, why should we believe you? The throat clearing. Well, <clears throat> um, I think it's just a little bit of nervousness because it questions his veracity. Uh, uh, at that point and he keeps his hands clasped because it's a pretty big deal for these questions to be asked in front of a crowd so that's understandable that he would look just a bit nervous in that way and you ask this question at the beginning and then it goes uh into people who felt bad about thinking he was guilty and we used to get letters from people that say oh you know i for years i thought you were the murders of murders of your daughter and i'm so sorry i felt that way he starts talking about that how, how bad they felt and he's trying to he's giving the impression there are a lot of people that believe him and believe that his family didn't do it um which, which is fine his illustrators are still on point and he uses them again fluently and this lets us know that he's relaxed he's done this before he's used to it and i think he's got his stock answers and depending on where he is he sort of plays off those uh those answers uh, adds to it or takes away from it, depending on what you could have a hostile crowd or you could have a really nice one. Apparently, this is a really nice one. It's a crime con, so they're really into hearing what he has to say. So I don't think they're going to give him a lot of, of uh, um, brush or push back on anything. But I'm not seeing any deception uh, so far or any big stress cues. And I think it's it's going smoothly so far. All right, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so 
he knows this question is coming. And so we do see him prepare himself. I think he crosses his legs. He bolts himself down a little bit. I think that's understandable. I'm not going to put that down as he he's, he's getting ready for his deception. Also, there are three clear no's, but different intonation on each. I like, Scott, that they, they go down in tonality each time. It's very finalized on that end one. Although you're absolutely right. Um, no, that's no. No, that's... No, I, you know, it. Uh, this interviewer, you know, one of the things you've got to do if you've got a high value interview is take your own pulse first, you know, look after yourself before you go into that high value interview, because you need to calm down during that. And, and I don't think this interviewer is, is calm enough to really get the best out of this situation because you're right she should have gone back on that or she should have let him answer fully because we want to know what is his view on this he has very different views on why not why no for each one of those participants and that's why i think we get a different intonation of no some subtle differences there no 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 because the reasons why it's not you know him or his wife or his son i think are very very uh different in his in his mind um look for me what's most interesting about this is that he says look media needed something to to fill their their airtime with we, we all have a little uh, media outlet called the behavior panel and um, there's just been this huge jamboree that's gone on of uh, johnny depp and amber heard okay which has caused many new channels to kind of bubble up because you know why not of course why not and there has been no bigger story since oj simpson this it's been a a once in in every quarter of a of a century tsunami of of interest which means money people have made a lot of money out of those stories okay and what if you'd have started a channel and then suddenly it disappears now what do you do now what are you going to do for viewers because you were part of that tsunami you were what you were riding this wave which was a hundred feet tall that only happens every quarter of a century now what are you going to do with your time because you haven't built up that base beforehand okay now you know we're good we've been going a long long time and we'll just keep doing what we've always done but if you put on top of that what if you bought airspace we don't buy any airspace we, this is all kind of free so this is low cost for us we show up we have a great time and we go home okay you know it's fantastic but what if we'd spent money we would be sitting here right now going man we've got to make our money back here we spent all that money out to the airwaves we've promised advertisers viewers we've got contracts right now what are we going to give them we would want a story and that's what he's highlighting here is he's not just you know a dad who's lost a child a family that's lost a child he's part of the media machine which is massive and these stories are are bigger than some of the biggest stories if if there if the benet story was as big as an oj that means it outclassed any of any royal stories if you put a Meghan markle there it would get wiped by it so i just want to you know Put, put it in that context that what he's saying there about media and the desire, the, the appetite for a big story is absolutely true and people's jobs depend on it. And, and he's as a, as a um, it's, it's very factual, I would suggest what he's saying there. Greg. Yeah, there's one other, one other key point. When you mentioned that his tone is different depending on the person, I know for a fact I didn't do it. I'm sure she didn't do it. There could be, and he could have knowledge and information that would be guilty knowledge if he released it to the public that tells him there's no way that child did it. There's also that. The piece that we don't know is all of that information that's been withheld so that when they get the right person, they know they've got the right person. He may have. He may have that and can't share it. So just remember that when you hear a person talk like that. Yeah, good point. John, we, I need to ask the question for all these people here. They need to hear your voice. Did you murder your daughter? No. Did Patsy? No. Did Burke? No, that's, no. Why should we believe you? Well, <clears throat> um, based, based on what the media reported, I don't know how you could believe otherwise. 
And we used to get letters from people that say, oh, you know, I, for years I thought you were the murderers of, murderers of your daughter, and I'm so sorry I felt that way. And I, I'd write them back and say, that's okay. How could you have believed otherwise based on what you were being told? Uh, you know, the media was vicious to us. The police were vicious. People were wonderful to us. Uh, you know, I was asked early on, how is it to be out in public? And I said, it's wonderful. People stop us, give us hugs, apologize for what's being said about us. I said, it really gave me an a understanding or an appreciation of my fellow man, that they care about other people. And it, it changed me personally. You know, I was pretty much a... I don't know, just insensitive, I guess, to the fact that most people carry a heavy burden. Mm -hmm. And life's not easy. And uh, I was just so touched by the people that would stop. And that even happened today. Uh, and it, this was a blessing. Uh, people stop us and, and pray for us. And, you know, um, at this meeting. And um, so people were wonderful to us. But, of course, the media was vicious. It was a, it was a uh, made-for-TV entertainment. And it was a billion-dollar industry for the media. Uh, the John Bonet Inc. It was called uh, in a in a magazine publication. Uh, you know, we came along when the O.J. Simpson trial had ended, and there was this whole bandwidth of media, court TV, all these things that were came up and alive because of the O.J. Simpson trial, and that was over. It's like, hey, what do we do with all this? airtime well then we came along and and filled it all right well let's roll around the room and uh tell what each one of us thinks about what's going on uh, a minute or less and mark you want to go first if you think that john ramsey murdered his own child in or was involved in that in any kind of way i will gamble big money you are barking up the wrong tree and wasting your time on this one and we've said that i've said that about other cases uh if you take me to the casino on that one i guarantee i'm gonna win i'm gonna win that casino chase what do you think i fully agree absolutely agree with you and i'm gonna throw a hypothetical situation in here really quick I think, in my opinion, there was 100% a legitimate killer that has yet to be identified as we know of. And here's this hypothetical situation. They thought John Bonet's brother, their son, uh, did this to her. Uh, he hit her with a golf club in real life recently before the murder took place to protect Ramsey. They staged the kidnapping attempt and later realized that he wasn't at fault. And I think all these years have passed and each passing day made it more difficult to admit that anything was done to protect their son at all costs because they may have thought he had done the act. This is hypothetical, but that one hypothetical situation makes every single anomaly in all of the behaviors, even the one we analyzed with Dr. Phil, all of the anomalies line up if that situation is is placed. Just my opinion. Uh, Greg, what do you got? Well, you sound like OJ, hypothetically. <laughs> Just, you know. Yeah, no, look, guys, something went on in this house that we can't see. Nobody can see. There's probably some guilty knowledge, some hidden information in there that we can't have access to because they're hoping to hold that to get that last person whether they have enough dna now he's asking for dna testing so look a guy doesn't come out and say dna test this and you'll prove me right if he knows he's going to prison he'd rather just this guy could quietly disappear if he killed his daughter i'm with mark if you think this guy killed his daughter this is a rare thing for me to say out loud i think you're absolutely wrong and we know that some of you know a hell of a lot more about this case than we do. And you're going to tell us how wrong we are in the comments. Good, because we're not going to change what we think because of what you tell us. We're telling you what we <clears> see. <throat> and this is based on behavior in these videos that we have watched. Now, I'll tell you, this is a complex case. There's a lot more to it than any of us know. And it's probably been so poorly handled over the past 25 years, it will never be solved. All you can hope is that somebody heard something and that they come forward and say something or somebody 
gets a conscience on their death, who knows how this will be solved. But this is going to be one of those that forever will be a big deal. I just think that a person who killed his child, number one, would not be bringing it up in the latter part of his life when he could quietly go away. Scott, what do you got? Uh, I see. And I see what you're saying, Chase. And m my thing originally was that they thought the, that Burke did it. Yes. And that's why she wrote the letter. Yes. But I, I, would, I didn't think about them going down there and like doing a whole scene about it. I think they did that before they found. I was under the impression that they, she wrote the letter before they found the child. And because when the cops showed up, they had the letter. So that that's what I thought happened. And I can't imagine a parent doing that to a child who's even, you know, who's passed away. I can't, I can't imagine them, the grief they would be in. Her I don't under. think they, they touched her. In that hypothetical situation, they wouldn't touch her at all. They just wrote a letter. And oh, okay. Her. I thought you meant they, they he did something did to her. Other stuff. Okay, I see what you're saying. Yeah, so that was my original thing. If she did write the letter, I think that's what happened. If she didn't write the letter, then game on. I think somebody broke in and did it. And I was always, always thought it was somebody like a, a workman or somebody who'd like um, – you know, clean, did the yard or something like that would know where, where that window was, know how to get in and be a little bit familiar with the place. That's what I always thought. Something like a, a handyman or something like that. That's what I thought. But if she wrote the letter, and I, th I, I, I think that's what happened. I go back to my original thing of, of they thought the kid did it, that Berg did it, and they were trying to protect him. So yeah. it makes the most sense to me. So, all right. I think this is another good one, fellas, and yeah. I'll see you next time.